I believe. Yeah, that was working. Great. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the week three for S2S monthly webinar. Uh, today, we have two speakers, including Dr. Diego Pons and Dr. Eric Maloney. So Diego is from uh, University of Denver, and Eric works at Colorado State University. Please refer to the week three four website posted in the chat box. And please also use the discussion document in the chat box during and even after the webinar. Uh, the speakers will contribute to the discussion document in order to address any questions or suggestions or comments from you. So to the end, our next webinar will be April 1st, 2 p.m. Eastern Day Time. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, to the speakers and let's start from Diego. It looks good. Thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, having me and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Ken, I'm going to start my presentation and please just confirm you can see my screen is uh, full screen. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect. So um, today I'm going to just talk a little bit about three study cases that we've been working on in Guatemala. So I'm going to take you through a little tour of Guatemala's geography because uh, all of each cases are uh, implemented in different locations of Guatemala. So the title of this presentation is Applied Climate Services, Managing Risk for Food Production, Fire Mitigation, and Energy Production in Guatemala. Again, my name is Diego Pons, and I'm affiliated to the University of Denver. Um, I'm going to talk about three study cases, one that deals with hydropower, the uh, second one with wildfires, and the third one with food production. Um, the order of this presentation follows um, the level of commitment and institutionalization that each of these study cases have gotten in Guatemala. So obviously, uh, in that case, the hydropower one is less implemented, while fires is um, on, on the making and the food production is fully implemented and assessed, actually. So to begin with the hydropower one, um, this is uh, a, a paper that is already available in this um, book chapter on safeguarding mountain social ecological systems. So you can access it there for um, more details about all the models you use here, the samples, the model of the statistics for bias correction that we use, et cetera, et cetera. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on the application side of it. But as Dr. Ken said, um, I'm, I'm available to answer uh, questions after the presentation, of course. So this is a, a, an applied system of uh, model ensemble using North American multimodal ensemble for forecasting stream flow in the upper Samala River watershed. For context, this is Guatemala, and you can see there the Samala watershed highlighted in red. It's right here, south of Guatemala, from the uh, volcanic chain all the way to the coast. Um, there we have several um, nested uh, dam systems. The first one is Santa Maria and is the one that we're going to be focusing on today. Naturally, this is the one that gets the natural discharge, so therefore um, it could be associated to, with precipitation. The other ones are just following uh, the cascade effect of that Santa Maria dam. It produces around 8% of Guatemala's hydropower um, and is uh, located between 1,500 and 1,400, 1,500 elevation uh, meters above sea level. That's the, the fall itself of the of the water. And you can see there are uh, others that follow through this watershed. Naturally, uh, hydropower here is, is related with, with uh, discharge, and you can see the bimodal distribution of precipitation in this particular location with the midsummer drought here um, in between July, August. And you can see, again, the, the production here. Um, this is 3.5, 3, 2.5 uh, megawatts. So uh, again, it's about eight um, megawatts that is, that is produced here yearly, or, or from eight to 10. And, and we were um, obviously identifying in this process, what are, the, what are the predictive skills that we have with this model ensemble that has been institutionalized in Guatemala's net service? Uh, we ended up working with, with this month that you can see the highest production of uh, energy associated with naturally the highest discharge. And the question was, of course, can we forecast those months and how far back can we do so? And if this is of any use to decision makers on the ground. This process started um, 
by connecting what we call the next generation seasonal forecast system that was produced by Columbia World Projects uh, starting in 2018 at the IRI in Columbia University. And this is how the webpage looks like in, in the Met Service in Guatemala. And you can see, therefore, um, we observe uh, smoothed out um, 30 years of, of climate data for that particular pen that I dropped here, for instance. And then you can see the forecast in, a, in what we call a, a flexible forecast system where you can have the availability or the demand, if you may, of, of um, precipitation on the x-axis and the probability of occurrence of at least getting a certain amount of, of, of precipitation. So this system is the basis of everything I'm going to be talking today. All the, the, the study cases are linked to this uh, operational system currently um, operating in, in Guatemala uh, at, the, at the country level. Uh, the model for those months, and I'm, this is a very quick summary because, again, this is uh, an example of um, application that has not been taken into, into um, you know, in, institutionalized in Guatemala yet. And that has several layers that I'm not going to talk about now, except saying that um, it's been harder and harder to get commitment from government agencies, particularly in the energy production um, realm, um, due to several conflicts of interest between knowing or anticipating actually the hydrological productivity of a, of a plant like this and how that relates to other commitments with oil and, and charcoal and stuff. But um, to our um, seminar, this is a, a very interesting diagram for um, area under the curve for hits and misses. And you can see that we do have some discrimination still here for above and below uh, normal precipitation associated with the discharge, of course. And also you can see the uh, reliability of the uh, uh, system, the model itself here for all the above, below, and normal, and independently for um, below and above um, forecasts. Um, this is, this is um, so we presented this to the um, Institute of A Energy in Guatemala, and they, uh, they, they want to adapt this. They are still, um, again, those barriers that I mentioned before are keeping the technicians from advancing this into institutionalization, but they like the flexible format that we presented to them, and they're not only uh, linking this to the energy production itself, and this is the Santa Maria Dam that you can see in the image, but also they are thinking that this could be useful for early warning systems downhill from the dam that could uh, prevent disasters as well. So it's not only, you know, once we uh, expect a drought that it can trigger some um, alternative fuel um, production, but also when we have above normal precipitation that it can help them manage the risk for um, flooding down the hill, which by the way has happened back in Guatemala in this particular watershed and completely destroy uh, a town. So, you know, they have that very in, in their radar and they're, um, again, we still have those barriers for adoption to, to be. Um, the, the next uh, study case relates to wildfires, and this is a study of, my, um, of uh, st a student of mine who started this project. Uh, we've been working on this now together to, to connect it with forecasts, but I'm going to go uh, real quick and, and show you where we are at. So this is wildfires and precipitation in the lowlands of Guatemala. We're shifting here from the southern slopes to northern Guatemala, so right here. Um, the reason we picked that area is because naturally, as you can see here, this is a land cover map. 33% of the remaining forests of Guatemala are mostly in this department of Teten. But also, unfortunately, the, the, the highest number of fires, both naturally occurring and, and anthrop anthropogenic fires, are also occurring in that area. So critical for, for us to understand if there is any predictive skill in associating precipitation with those fires. So. We started by selecting the, you know, assessing obviously the wildfires, and you can see here the 2001 all the way to 2021. Uh, and I highlighted here the month that uh, Campus more than 95% of the total fires in, occurring in the lowlands of Guatemala. The other thing you can see in this um, time series is that the, the the fires are starting to spread out to more recent uh, in, in more in, in more recent years to more broadly across the year, which is obviously a bit concerning. Uh, not the point of study of this um, assessment, but you know, super interesting to notice that. So based on this table, we picked the April, uh, the March, April, May season for uh, assessing forecasting. 
as our uh, key element to to evaluate. And we had several questions. So we understood we understood that fire and and, and precipitation relate in different manners, right? Uh, we know for for um, for example that precipitation in preceding uh, month can lead up to more biomass than then you know can can uh, function with more fuel available for the actual fire season. So we did this assessment with several lack correlations between uh, available vegetation indices and the uh, and the precipitation from chirps, and then we established that. And I'm going to jump in a second to the results there. Um, and once we understood that, we also moved to assessing um, other uh, potential impacts. So, for instance, on lag zero, we assessed the impact of precipitation during the fire season. And naturally, as you can imagine, precipitation there uh, plays a different role with fires. It actually diminishes the, the frequency of fires, of course. Um, but at, at the end, we have this assessment uh, and we got a lot of gain for, for um, NDVI, uh, SMN, which is the smooth NDVI anyways, VCI, uh, TCI, and Vegetation Health Index. And there's consistency among them when it comes to uh, using this as proxies for uh, photosynthetic activity and, and plant health that we consider um, obviously a proxy to biomass. Um, but overall, um, after the entire research, which uh, is still uh, is about to be published, uh, you can relate the, the precipitation in preceding month to increased frequency of fires, and uh, but only if precipitation was uh, above normal on the three preceding months, and then there was a dry period in between that biomass creation and the and the actual fire occurrence. So basically, in this graph you can see uh, simplified that you have precipitation that then ends up with vegetation growth and then drying up which ends up um, creating higher uh, conditions for, um, for fires. Overall, if we, if we can predict uh, December, January, February uh, precipitation, if we can forecast that, we can then relate that to vegetation growth, uh, obviously growth as, as fuel. And then if there's a uh, dry period, that's when we get a, a big amount of fuel that is ready to be burned and we have evidence that it uh, increases the fire occurrences. I just met last week with the uh, National uh, Forestry Service to begin to move forward with this. They are keen to work with us as uh, you know, we have to uh, connect this to standard operating procedures on the ground with many, many agencies, uh, not only from the, from the, um, from the Forestry uh, Institute, but uh, including uh, police and other institutions that are in charge of are regulating uh, wildfires and, and managing them as well. So that's that's moving forward. Uh, there's acceptance at the institutional level to try and use this system based on the uh, next gen that I already showed at the beginning. And then the, the one that is going to take me a bit longer to discuss is uh, food production. Here, the study case relates to World Food Programs, the UN um, World Food Program Agency. And they're currently moving towards anticipatory actions uh, in many regions, of course, of the world. But um, it's happening in Guatemala as well, in the dry corridor area. Uh, just to highlight a little bit of that area. So I'm, I, I've been talking about Petén for the fires. Then we moved to from um, the watershed here in the south. Now we're going into East Guatemala and the dry corridor. Uh, it's an area that gets around 60, 600, 700 millimeters of precipitation a year, which doesn't sound too dry, but when you compare it to other regions like uh, this area that gets 4,000 millimeters, then you, you understand why we call it that. Um, that's a study area, that's the department of Chiquimula. Um, key to this assessment and to the success that I'm gonna show on, on applied climate services here is interpreting and, and validating local agroclimatic calendars. So for instance, if you only look at this calendar and source in English, this is an official uh, calendar for Guatemala, the corn here is, is planted around May, June, and it, it suggests that it's harvested in October, November. When in reality, after a process I'm gonna uh, show you in a second, um, the corn is actually ready in August. It just remains on the ground for drying in a process called La Dobla, where the um, corn plants are turned down to uh, dry out in the field. So if you're uh, in a data depleted country like Guatemala, where you don't have 
records of corn production at this scale, you need to use a proxy. And what we um, tested here was, again, using vegetation health indices to understand if we could um, you know, uh, relate the greenness, the photosynthetic activity to the success of crops in this region. Naturally, uh, the not understanding well the climatic calendar and the cycles in this region will lead to uh, misleading assessments. This is a corn plantation that has been used afterwards for planting beans, which is what you can see on the ground. And naturally, you will, uh, you know, the satellite will perceive uh, reflectance from that bean and not necessarily from the corn. So it can be confusing and misleading. Um, also, understanding the timing of the of the corn was super important. So here in Guatemala's uh, area that is highlighted in yellow means all the dry corridor areas produce 60% of the of the corn um, for Guatemala in the first um, season, which is June, July, August. And then we have another season uh, that produces around 40%. But this is an example that shows uh, the relevance of that first season, but also how much can be lost to drought. And here, that 30.61%, that's what's lost on productivity due to drought during that 2016-2017 uh, season. So it was it was really, really bad. Um, as you all remember, 2014, 15, 16 was uh, really, really uh, dry conditions to El Nino and Guatemala. So we validated those um, calendars with the extension service agents from the Minister of Agriculture and Agriculture themselves. We allocated them uh, based on the map that we had, but not necessarily the latest map, to make sure that we were targeting the right locations for corn. Um, and we also uh, asked them the exact dates of planting and the exact dates of, of harvesting so that we can calibrate our assessment from vegetation indices very, very well. After doing that, we created a hydrological demand per day. And you can see here, um, after you know having a, a standard variety that grows for 112 days, we understood now the sowing date, so we can actually fix this in a calendar. And uh, after assessing that, we, um, as you can see here, up to 90% uh, plus of the hydrological demand of corn actually happens in June, July, August. Um, this helps us naturally identify our season of interest for forecasting and ass assessing predictive skill. But relevant to this and surpassing another of the limitations with uh, data, is this assumption that this is also from the dry corridor in Guatemala, and this is a phenological drawing of, of corn. And you can see that no matter when uh, the, the drought happens or the deficit in precipitation, uh, it leads to loss in, in the corn productivity, either number of plants, uh, number of, of fruits, right, of, 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 uh, of corn, but also uh, the weight of corn can be impacted. In this case, here you have 300 plus 200 plus 200 millimeters, so 700 millimeters uh, during June, July, August, and some, some corners of May and September, but it can lead up to losses of 25, 50, and 25%. The idea here, as, as limited as the seasonal forecast was, is that even if we have, uh, um, if we don't reach the amount that is set as a trigger, in this case, 600 millimeters, right? it will anyways have an impact on the crop productivity. And that, that was very useful for Wolfer program because then that trigger was linked to um, cash, uh, you know, giving cash to these communities or giving uh, new seeds for these communities to plant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is, you know, uh, corn in this dry corridor area of Guatemala. And you can see on the left-hand side, uh, some of that corn is already drying. It should look like the healthy V6 stage that you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, but, you know, this is the assumption that once you have a loss due to drought, this is the reflective that you will be capturing from the index, from the vegetation index, and therefore you can link that to losses on the ground. Uh, eventually, as we had the June, July, August precipitation, we use anomalies to compare against the vegetation health index. We did it with many others, but we found that this has the, the, the highest predictive skill for August vegetation health index. When that crop it is either dead by then, if, if there was a, um, a deficit in precipitation or not. And so that's, that's when we started to, to build this, this system. Um, a, li a little bit less uh, availability to discriminate here than compared with the initial models used in the, 
um, discharge example, but uh, there's still uh, enough reliability on the model to work. Uh, obviously, I'm not showing you all the calibration that went through and the Spearman correlation and the um, two alternative four choice and, and all these other um, tests that we do on the models after the example, but again, that's available upon request. Um, now, this has been applied on the ground by the Wolf program and evidence suggests that the trigger worked, but assistance provided. So the actions linked to this trigger were not enough uh, to overcome the crisis associated with the famine. This is actually an extract from that assessment that was carried by a, a third party independent assess, uh, uh, assessing team. Um, getting the climate information was actually 100% perceived as in time. Um, you or someone in, in your uh, home received the information at the right moment to make decisions, 68% uh, against the baseline of 48%. Um, was the information clear and it allowed to comprehend how the climate will affect your livelihood? 58% agreed on that compared to 12%. But again, was the system uh, provided, given the trigger, enough to re recover from the loss? And that's where not a single person of a thousand plus uh, interviewed um, said that, that that was enough. And this brings me to my conclusion, which is in this particular case where institutionalization and adoption has happened and an assessment has been run, um, you, climate services themselves don't provide the, the you know, the, the success of, of, of the forecast to transfer to, to the people. It, it has to be paired with finance, right? It has to be assess, equally assessed uh, how we're going to finance the activities that can be linked to climate services, and in this particular case, to triggers regarding precipitation and uh, staple crop productivity. So um, I'm going to leave it there to to remain in time, and I appreciate your time. And I'm again, this is my email, and I'm available for questions as Dr. Ken suggested. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So, any other questions? Thank you, Diego. So, I put some questions. So, I think we have we have we have like a couple of minutes. So, so one of the question is, uh, uh, it's a victory for forecasting. More more focusing on the atmospheric side, but um, it's very interesting to see like more hydrological cycles in Guatemala area because we are seeing severe drought there. So is, is there any uh, hydrologic modeling effort ongoing in Guatemala area to address the discharge change in the river? There are, and they're currently run by the National Electrification uh, Institute. So if interested, I can connect you with them. Sounds good. So. Even after the meeting, uh, please contribute to the answer to the question. And then also I highly encourage the attendees to have any questions or comments and suggestions in the discussion chat box. Thank you so much, Diego. Uh, Diego. Thank you. Right. Okay, our next speaker will be Eric Maloney from Colorado State University. All right, can you hear me? Let me see. I'm not able to share my screen. Hold on a um, second. Yeah, I think yeah. it automatically reset it, so I'll make you a presenter. And I'll click. 